I think what is in, and we know, we, uh, we don't want to necessarily personalize the discussion around uh, personal or other ambitions. These are the forces that make cities. Uh, these are the issues that Peter, determine. This is personal for me. Okay. No, 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 no. This is very no, no. personal. No, no, because no, we have suffered from the no. evil in cities, from no. the immorality of cities no. and states, but and money so and like officials the last two days, The last two days have been about also trying to unpack and uh, take out the layers so that this discussion can actually happen. Think of the last three hours. I'm also intrigued by hearing what we've just said, what, how this connects to what Vernon Henderson said yesterday morning. And it connects totally to, I think, what is being said here, which is the issue of productivity and density. Right? And, and you can abstract these notions, or you, you can give it a very real sense, which can be controversial. Of course, we've heard that in the room. But on the other hand, the deep connections between a spatial solution, uh, the quality of life, but also the quality of work, and all that is, is absolutely central. I think that's also what you're getting at. And I don't think that's necessarily challenged by what has been said. Now, we are coming up to, unfortunately, the end of uh, this session. Uh, can I ask uh, Parks if you want to just reflect on anything? And Zibong, we haven't come back to you for any further thoughts. Just, just two points I, I wanted to reflect on. The first is that as we speak, we also need to realize that some of what we're discussing as solutions also present themselves as threats. So in an environment like in South Africa where electricity is a revenue generator for local government, off-grid solutions are a threat to the local authority. Where the uh, petrol levy, a share of the petrol levy is part of the revenue that goes to metropolitan municipalities. Uh, when you're talking about electric cars, you're talking about a revenue threat to, to municipalities. So you do need to think about it in an integrated way and manage a transition that is just, that's sustainable, uh, and that enables you to achieve your objectives without undermining the reality that it could potentially, if you don't plan in an integrated way, present as a threat. That's the first point. The second point, which I think the discussion covered to a large extent, is that there possibly is the need to continuously keep, particularly in an urban development space, the linkage of the urban land systems, starting from land ownership to spatial planning to land use management to property tax to infrastructure investment and to being able to then generate the revenue from those investments to then thinking about, I think part of what Sam is saying is how do we then leverage through tax incremental financing mechanisms, uh, land value capture mechanisms where public infrastructure investments enables us to then leverage additional taxes from the investors that enables reinvestments into the city. So there needs to be almost a complete cycle of the land development and land use management system in the city that's linked to revenue and taxation. Thanks. I think I've listened to what the other panelists have, have said. And I think that um, when it comes to, to funding, you know, um, infrastructure in, in local government areas, um, there is a lot that still has to be done. And it's going to be difficult to do that without um, private sector contribution. Um, I think it's very essential and very important. Um, because if you want to increase you know, your revenues, and we are looking at property taxes as a possible um, area um, over which you can increase the revenues, you need properties. <coughs> All right? Um, this is not to say that there are no sensitive issues around um, property ownership, around land issues, and but I think um, the private sector, the public sector can find common ground where um, the cities would actually develop, where um, revenues would be generated, but ultimately where the, the private sector, the public sector, and the, the citizens work together to make this happen. Um, in cities across the continent, and I'll take a case, the case of Cameroon, for example, um, it's very difficult um, to, to sort of develop properties. And if you've, if you've been to Cameroon, you'd notice that um, one of the challenges we're having is um, funding high-rising buildings 
for the simple reason that the regulations are a bit tough. Um, unlike in other cities on the continent where those buildings are sort of, um, you know, um, propping up. Um, but the bottom line of what I, I intend to say is I, I think strongly that you need the private sector. You need the private sector to be able to, to, to sort of um, develop, you know, the infrastructure and the buildings on the basis of which um, the, the local governments will be able to fund, fund infrastructural development. Um, so I stand on the wall, and I think um, private sector important, uh, communities and their personal and sort of their, their feelings need to be taken into consideration as well. But ultimately, we need, we need common ground to be able to, to, to move on. So thank you. That's uh, the end of, of what I think was an extremely interesting discussion. Um, Ricky uh, ceded to me to perhaps summarize what I think was, was fairly complex discussions. But I think I can summarize it in, in, in five points that I hopefully will, will come in, the, will reflect what people said. So I think what we know from the past few days, and this is the first point, is that for the cities that are already there and the cities that are yet to come, we need finance. I think that's relatively clear and a relatively agreed upon point. I think what uh, uh, Tunde very well said, um, and that's my second point, it's there. Um, it's around the corner. But then what Sami and, and Zibong were talking about is that it actually needs to be unleashed. So even though it's there, we haven't figured out how to unlock it yet. And I think uh, uh, Sami was talking about from the land perspective, Zabong talking about the property perspective, there, there are other perspectives. And then I think the, the, the fourth point, which I think, um, Parks, I'm just gonna quote you because I think you said it so well, is that we've got to remember that the solution is part of a threat. And that was reflected in Jennifer's comments, right? So um, we know what, Jennifer knows what she wants to do, but she can't do it because it's seen as a threat. And then I think the fifth point, sort of bringing now from, from Zedeke's perspe perspective, is that when we think about how we're going to unleash and unlock these financing potential for cities, we need to think about doing it in, in a way that improves livability, but not at the expense of the city dwellers. So I'm hoping that that summarized uh, relatively the discussion. <laughs> So let me end by thanking my co-chair, who did a great job, and thanking the panelists. But hold on, uh, two messages, two important messages. You now have a very short coffee. Uh, if any of you have lost anything, there is a lost pro Go to the front desk. Apparently, someone's without a blue jacket. Uh, but, you know, uh, lost property at the front. And it has been alluded to, but in the next couple of weeks, most of the presentations that you've seen uh, uh, will be available online as PDFs on the Urban Age website. So I've seen a lot of you taking pictures of slides, which is great, uh, but you should be able to actually have the full recordings, uh, but also the PDFs of the PowerPoints. On that note, thank you again, and see you in 15 minutes.